Good evening, everybody. Thank you, and welcome to the opening event of Tacoma Park's 125th anniversary. I'm glad you're all here, and I'm glad that uh, we're also putting this out over, uh, you know, cable TV, video. It'll be on the website in perpetuity. Um, and I want to thank uh, everybody who helped make this possible, and I want to make sure that we all have a chance to uh, look forward for uh, opportunities to reflect on our history as a community and to look forward to what we can become in the future. Yeah. And I want to share just a couple words from the uh, letter that President Obama sent. Yeah. That's here. And he says, I'm pleased to join all of those celebrating the 125th anniversary of Tacoma Park. This special occasion is an opportunity to reflect on the past and envision what's possible in the future. And then he says some more things, and he concludes with, as you, as you celebrate this milestone, I wish you all the best in the years ahead. So we're going to start our program with uh, some words from our Tacoma Park Poet Laureate, Merrill Leffler. I'm not sure, are you the third, fourth, third Poet Laureate? And... Uh, Welcome to the Poet Laureate. Thank you. I think it's uh, probably appropriate that whoever is the Poet Laureate should be here on the 125th anniversary of Tacoma Park. Um, and I wanted to um, say something. I'm, I'm going to read a poem, and a poem that I, is particular to Tacoma Park. But you know, the, uh, as Bruce said, I'm the third. I, I am the third poet laureate. Um, Don Berger was the first, and Ann Becker was the second. And if, and it truly is an honor to represent Tacoma Park, and I have in a number of different venues around the city and the area. Uh, but I've also said, and I think I really need to emphasize it again tonight, that the poet laureateship is really a tribute to the city council. Um, because it, it's a recognition of the role of the arts. Poetry is one of the arts. Look at what we have out here. It's really pretty fantastic, and around the city. Uh, and numbers of different groups are participating in making this happen. Um, the, uh, I brought down a poster. Many of you have seen the Spring for Poetry in Tacoma Park. And as I said the other night um, at the great celebration that we had for the memory of Sam Abbott and the unveiling of that bronze relief out there, it's certainly more than a plaque, um, that this, it's, it's really great having poetry out on the streets. And this is a collaboration between the friends of the Tacoma Park Maryland Library and Montgomery College, the School of Art and Design. I've been working with Professor Andrea Adams for the last seven years. And I want to say, since he is sitting here, every one of these posters is framed. Claire Garman over here has been doing yeoman work over all these years, so, uh, or else they wouldn't be up. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to, very briefly, I want to read a poem that I wrote especially, um, and then, uh, you know, uh, one of the things about uh, running this, I could publish it myself here. Uh, but. I was thinking about here we have a Tacoma Park. Now we have a memorial to fall into the war dead, but it's only in Tacoma Park that we have a bronze statue of, you know, right in the middle, right under the old town of Roscoe. And uh, where else but in Tacoma Park did we have that? So uh, I did a piece that I called Roscoe Magnus, and Magnus in Latin is big, Ma is big Roscoe. And the reason I did that was because I, I said this was an anonymous second century BCE translation by Merrill Leffler. Um, the thing is that this is a French form, and a couple of people asked me, God, do you really speak Latin? Well, of course, I was playing around, and it's the poem I want to read. Now, the poem is a serious poem, but it, as in much poetry, it can come in a comedic way. And when I say it's serious, it has to do with hubris. Any of you from, um, remember in high school, we had to read Ozymandias by Percy Bysshe Shelley, in which the ruins of this great dictator at one time are just lying there. Nobody knows anything about him. 
Well, I wasn't aware that that's what was in my mind, but I was kind of parodying that in this poem about Roscoe. So this is, um, it was called Roscoe Magnus, but then when I published it in this book, um, I called it Roscoe of Tacoma Park. There's also a prequel, which I won't say, but this is before he became imprisoned in bronze. Uh, there are, you'll hear a repetition of lines, and the reason you know, there are repetitions, it's not because I couldn't think of other lines, but it's a French form called the Villanelle. So it goes like this. Behold me here, imprisoned now in bronze, where once I held command of this great street, cock of the walk, who strode with rooster gods. Oh, Roscoe, you're the one, just like the Fonz was once, they cry and bow down at my feet. <laughs> Behold me now, imprisoned here in bronze. I strutted all about like the lords, my cocks come high. I was more than great cock of the walk, who strode with rooster gods. I had an eye for chicks, and with my foul glands, I took the measure of their tender meat. And now, look at me, fettered here in bronze. Oh, I'd rather be a lonely hen who plods each day and has to beg the smallest treat. I, me, Roscoe, who strode with rooster gods. So go, you passers-by and common clods. Know that you too will leave in damned defeat. Gaze at me now, imprisoned here in bronze. Cock of the walk, who strode with rooster gods. So there we are. Thank you. Now Diana Cohn is going to present a brief history of Tacoma Park. Diana Cohn, president of Historic Tacoma. Or the history lady, as my radio um, DJ name will be. set up here. Good evening, honored guests, residents, and visitors. On behalf of the Historic Tacoma, I am pleased to be here on this special evening. What follows is a brief journey through Tacoma Park's 125 years. First, a prologue. Tacoma Park would not exist without Washington, D.C. Therefore, we must start in 1790 when George Washington's supreme political skills resulted in the creation of a federal district. That brought Andrew Ellicott, accomplished surveyor, here in 1792. He and his crew carefully placed a granite boulder to mark the division between Maryland and the new capital then cleared a 20-foot path stretching one mile to the site of the next boundary stone. Our marker still stands, as you can see. Let's see. Now how am I supposed to? Huh? Oh, that way. <laughs> All right. Whoops. Whoops. There, got it. This gentleman should need no introduction. Benjamin Franklin Gilbert's vision of a commuter suburb along the railroad line remains valid today. The task of turning the rural landscape you see here into orderly streets proved daunting. It's still there. Oops, I went backwards. Okay. Gilbert himself was a master promoter. His brochures with pen and ink drawings convinced friends, relatives, and federal clerks to join him on his adventure. By 1888, there were 70 houses clustered around the newly constructed b &O Railroad Station. It took several years, however, to settle the debate between Tacoma with a C and Tacoma with a K.
residents formed a citizens association and joined with Gilbert to lobby for a schoolhouse and collected donations to build Union Chapel, which hosted all religions and community events as well. The Citizens Association also pushed for status as a town. The, mayor, the Maryland governor signed the Act of Incorporation on April 3, 1890. The May election, as you can see, was a two-party contest, but Gilbert easily captured the mayor's seat. Incorporation meant the ability to tap state and county funding for capital projects, something we still do, but on the downside, it excluded the residents across the border in D.C. Eighteen ninety, one thing was missing, a city hall. City clerk Ben Davis solved the problem of where to store official documents by taking them home. His house, by the way, is featured on this year's House and Garden Tour. So come see it for yourself, May 3rd. One of the first orders of business after sidewalks was a bond bill for a public water system. This photo, taken at the intersection of Carroll and Ethan Allen, shows the water tower that held the water pumped from Sligo Creek. Trolleys like the one here um, is on its way to Sligo Creek supplemented train travel. Nineteen oh four, Ellen White, spiritual head of the Seventh day Adventists, moved her entire church here after fires destroyed their Battle Creek, Michigan headquarters. She liked Gilbert's teetotaler ways, and he welcomed her promise to build a hospital. The sand, shown here, and a college graced the banks of Sligo Creek, while the publishing house and conference headquarters opened up the Carroll Laurel intersection. For decades, one-third of Tacoma residents were Adventist. Nineteen eleven. The Citizens Association targeted the railroad crossing at Cedar Avenue for drastic alteration. Tons of dirt were removed from under the railroad tracks to create a separate underpass for wheeled traffic. That's what we see now. Imagine trying to do this project today. 1921, the children in the community asked that the annual Independence Day celebration be expanded to include a parade, and the adults agreed. Thanks to a new set of volunteers, this year's parade will go on as usual. All right. Love it. Love it. This is my favorite map. It combines both Tacoma, Maryland and Tacoma, D.C. and reflect, reflects the community bond existing in 1922. It was prepared as part of the 1923 Tacoma Fair celebrated along Carroll Avenue. This close-up from the map shows the area in the top part of the map, around today's community center. It was then Hodges Dairy Farm, and Philadelphia Avenue did not intersect with Maple. Wow. 
the volunteer fire department decided in 1923 to build a real fire station on Carroll Avenue, just below Ethan Allen. They lugged boulders from Sligo Creek and paid for its, the station construction by staging summer carnivals on the empty lot next door, the city parking lot. Their move prompted the county to extend Philadelphia Avenue east to intersect with Carroll. When the station opened in 1928, it became the favored site for Tacoma, for Tacoma Town Council meetings in the fire station. Meanwhile, Walter Dudley, the fire chief, you see everyone wore different hats. The Citizens Association president would be the mayor the next year. He organized the first Chamber of Commerce, and I will point out it says Tacoma, Maryland and Tacoma, D.C., which took over the Citizens Association role of assisting the council in its quest for money for major improvements. When the Depression hit, local merchants were able to weather bad times, partly with the support of residents. This ad says in part, quote, there is nothing better than a community spirit for local patronage. Spend your money in Tacoma Park. And we thought we invented Shop Local. <laughs> Despite the hard times, the Chamber of Commerce successfully pushed for three major road improvements. First, the Sligo Creek Bridge, the one that we are about to uh, have boarded up for a year. The widening and extension of Pawnee Branch Road and creating the superhighway we know as New Hampshire Avenue. I will point out the small picture, which is a little fuzzy, is a newspaper clipping of the opening of the bridge. And if we put that many people on it today, it would collapse. <laughs> War intervened, but life finally got back to normal. The 4th of July parades resumed, as you can see on the poster, and a memorial honoring the war dead was erected at the corner of Maple and Philadelphia. And Mayor Bruce asked me to point out the war memorial. A revitalized Chamber of Commerce under the direction of John Goff, excuse me, John Kaufman editor of the Tacoma Journal, he's the one on the far, on the far right-hand corner, um, along with councilperson Robert Hefner, who's standing next to him, they tackled the reorganization and modernization of the government of Tacoma Park. The first thing they did was declare that we were now the city of Tacoma Park. Then they reorganized the fire department as a city department. They took over policing duties from the county and they organized a recreation department. Plus, they purchased the old Adventist school at 8 Columbia to serve as the first proper municipal building. All the new reforms were in place by the 60th anniversary of the town, rather the city's incorporation. Residents are seen here celebrating at Laurel and Carroll Avenue. There were still issues to be dealt with, school integration for one, but Lee Jordan's dedication for decades organizing sports for boys and girls, blacks and whites, helped in the transition. 
Women also played their part, especially Ruth Pratt, seen here, who was passionate about libraries. Her library outgrew three buildings before moving into this dedicated space, which is facing debate these days as to how to expand. In 1963, Jackie, Jackie Brazil became Tacoma Park's official sister city. For decades, high school students like Granacha, shown here with Mayor Miller, traded places for the year. <laughs> then, one morning in 1964, Ed Hotmeyer called up his neighbor, Sammy Abbott, and said, do you know the state wants to build a freeway through Tacoma Park? And that, and the battle to preserve the community's existence began right there. After years of protest, they managed to wrangle approval for a metro station, and then Montgomery College opened a new battlefront with their efforts to demolish the elegant homes of Block 69. Etta Mae Davis, shown here, couldn't stop the demolition of her neighbor's house, but she saved her own house and the rest of the block. And then came the infamous mustard sheet. In case you haven't seen it, it is printed on gaudy yellow paper. That's why it's called the mustard sheet. The mayor, Mayor Miller, supported it. The citizens opposed it. Guess who won? Meanwhile, Mayor Miller got his wish, shown here presiding over the groundbreaking of a modern city hall, only to die weeks before the municipal building was officially opened. The new metro station returned Tacoma Park to its days as a commuter suburb and sparked revival. And that's 1978. I have to go back to 1973 because this battle over the schools took a whole decade. The school board announced in 1973 that it would close Tacoma Park Elementary School. The seasoned warriors of years of protest took the board to court and in the end kept the school open, only to have the school board try to close Tacoma Junior High. This time, the building was empty before the county, before the county reprieved and reversed their decision. The first one is the Tacoma Elementary and the second is the Folk Festival event that funded, that benefited the effort to keep the middle school open. Yeah. Festivals blossomed. The folk festival offered free music and raised money for kids and vegetarian food in the beginning. The Victorian festival celebrated the revival of old Tacoma and has since morphed into the fall um, street festival. And there are always causes. Declaring Tacoma Park nuclear free, yeah. Tacoma Park a tree city, and creating historic districts continue to be signs up all over town. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Love it. In 1985, with Reagan's war on the Central America, the causes became global. Yeah. Tacoma Park joined the sanctuary movement and CASA grew out of those efforts. But the crowning achievement from a government, governing point of view was the unification of Tacoma Park entirely within Montgomery County. I'm sure our honored guests will have plenty more to say about this topic. So I will end with two maps. The one on the left 
is Tacoma Park in 1906. You'll recognize the outlines, but much of the center is empty. This was Gilbert's plan, This essentially the boundary lines that we still have. And the one on the right shows today's ward structure, an innovation that dates to 1980, and you'll hear more about that tonight, as well as the shift from the city manager, um, the shift to the city manager council government, which, by the way, gave the mayor a vote for the first time. More about that to come. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Um, Thank you. I want to introduce various people who are here, but I want to pause for a second and just introduce one of our former council members who has to leave and go somewhere else, and I want to give him a chance to say a few words. And so if you'll welcome Mark Elrich. So while Dan was talking, I made a, a few notes to myself. Uh, I moved to the city in 1981, and it was a conscious decision by my family uh, to live in a place that had a strong sense of community that was I, what we considered at the time intentionally integrated, and to be able to raise our kids in a diverse community, and to be among people who had the means to live someplace else in Montgomery County, but who chose to live here. And that meant a lot to me. It meant a lot to my family. And so I was, I was really happy to live here. And I got involved right away with a group called Neighborhood, Neighbors Together, Neighborhoods Together. And uh, they were doing a lot of um, tenant organizing, uh, working with the tenant groups in the city, um, dealing with the, the, the enormous housing problems we had. Um, I don't know how many of you remember how bad Maple Avenue was, but I remember when I got elected to the council being being in meetings where we actually were marched down to the apartment buildings by the residents so we could see water cascading through the walls and being asked, what are you going to do about that? Um, very, very active and been in a very different place. I was involved in the founding of the Tacoma Park Silver Spring Co-op, uh, which was the work of a lot of people in this community and in the Silver Spring community. And the co-op would go on also I don't know if you, people remember this, to get the first beer and wine license in Tacoma Park. This had been a dry city. And uh, we had the first beer and li wine license when the co-op operated the Tacoma Cafe. Um, we became a sanctuary city, and we became a nuclear-free zone. Yeah. And I was really proud of our actual active policy of non-cooperation with the INS. Right. And we would have discussions about what would happen if they come here and they want us to cooperate with their folks. And we said, our police are not cooperating with you. We are not cooperating with you. And I think there was a period of time we also didn't fill out the forms that we required, IN17 or something like that. Um, and it was, it was really wonderful to be part of a community like that. I was involved with a lot of you in the fight over Silver Spring development. And some of you, I'm sure, remember the Silver Spring Tacoma Park Traffic Coalition. And Tacoma Park was put on in the second part of that to allay any fears in the county that this was a Tacoma Park organization. There was a time when, when I started here, and I think everybody remembers this, when being from Tacoma Park had a whole list of assumptions about what you were like and what you were going to do and how you'd behave and what you were. And I didn't, I maintained the what you wore problem because <laughs> I never learned that one. But, uh, there was, it was just, you know, we kind of knew we'd run into a buzzsaw. And one of the things I tried to do as a council member was personally involve myself in fights around the county that affected other neighborhoods because I felt that to the extent that we showed that what happened someplace else mattered to us, it would help other people when we were in the middle of fights to say the things that happened there mattered to us too. And I thought it was really important to break the isolation of the city and, you know, for the years that I ran for the council, it was always sort of a joke 
that I was from Tacoma Park, and we all knew what kind of people were from Tacoma Park, and that was a very real, real thing. Um, I remember the fight to keep Tacoma Junior High up, and, and also the fight against the school board that was led by Marion Greenblatt. And their bad policies went well beyond um, just the closing of the school, and the result of that eventually was the election of Blair Ewing and other reformers to the school board, which really changed the school board and, and uh, led to a greater, I think, a final acknowledgement of the achievement gap problems that, that existed in the county and unfortunately can continue to exist till today. Um, we passed not one but two resolutions against two Iraq wars, and we were right. And didn't make everybody comfortable, but the fact is we were right. And we were able to see, we were able to see what apparently Colin Powell couldn't see, that this was just a big mistake and it was going to lead to an ongoing disaster. And I'm really proud of being in a community where you could have that discussion and, um, and come out of it on the right side. And city unification, I almost wore my, my Tacoma t-shirt here now, the unification t-shirt. I actually found it in my drawer today. But I decided, I was, I was debating between a shirt with no tie or a shirt and a tie, and I decided I, I'll go with the shirt with no tie. A t-shirt might be too much. So, <laughs> so many people would remember me on the council for wearing a t-shirt. Um, one of the things about the unification fight is, was a lesson I'd never quite learned. I got called up the night of the election by a reporter, and the reporter kept pressing me, like, well, what do you think is going to happen in the election? I said, we're going to unify Montgomery County. And she said, but what if we don't? And I said, it's not going to happen. We're going to unify in Montgomery County. And she kept pressing me and pressing me, and I got exasperated. And she said, what would you do if you wound up unifying in Prince George's County? And I said, I'd rather be dead than be in Prince George's County. And <laughs> that was the line that made it into the newspaper. <laughs> Um, I really try hard. I don't always really succeed, but I try hard trying to avoid saying things like that. Um, <laughs> but it's tough sometimes. Uh, but, you know, to me, the, the crowning achievement of this community, frankly, is rent stabilization. Because this would not be the integrated community that it is today. It would not have the racial, ethnic diversity that it has today if we had gotten rid of rent stabilization. These apartments would have been gentrified and changed a long time ago. And those families would have been gone. And I feel now like I felt then they would not have been in Montgomery County. They would have been in another county with a school system where none of us would have sent our kids to. And I remember these discussions on the council. And I wanted people to think about what would be the result of that kind of change to the community would it be good. Would it be good for people, or would it be bad for people? And you know, it might have meant we would have had more tax revenue here, in a marginal way. But I think the cost to human beings would have been enormous. And I'm really proud that this city passed that legislation, strengthened the legislation, and has stuck by the legislation. And I'm making one more run of in trying to introduce it into the county as well. But I've I've really been happy to be part of this community. I'm happy to say I still live here. Uh, I could not think of a better place to live. I couldn't live in a better neighborhood. All neighborhoods are great. My neighborhood's the best. But, you know, <laughs> we all say this. I deal with Sidney Katz, who's, you know, the former mayor of Gaithersburg. And when he gets up and talks, he says, the greatest city in, in uh, Maryland. And then I get up and talk, I say, well, I'm from the greatest city in Maryland. <laughs> so there is this competition over geographical places. But I just wanted to thank everybody for, for the work you've done. I served with really great people on the council here. I miss the kind of um, progressivism that exists in Tacoma Park, does not exist in Montgomery County. Uh, my council is not like this council. Um, and I really appreciated working with people who had, first and foremost, a commitment to the residents they serve, that we could joke about how long we'd make land use attorneys wait at meetings before, before we heard from them. Or I remember one time when Pepco, Washington Gas, and somebody else was here, and I think we moved them to the back of the agenda so we'd hear them at 11 o'clock at night because we knew their meter was running. And <laughs> so, you know, you can't do that in many places, but, you know, 
it did happen here, and I'm glad I was a part of it, and I'm glad I was in a community that kind of has the, the tolerance and the caring for other human beings that we have in Tacoma Park. So I just wanted to say a few words, and thank you all for coming here. And I want to apologize for one thing. I missed the dedication um, with Sam Abbott, and that was not a slight on my part. The county council had public hearings that started at 7 o'clock on the budget. I have to sit there and I have to listen. That's, that's my job now. And so I miss that, and I feel really bad about it because Sam was a great mentor and a friend, and uh, his friendship meant a lot. And as you've heard before, his leadership meant an enormous amount to the community. So I apologize for having missed that, but I want people to know I would have been here if I could have been here. And thank you all. So I wanted to introduce a whole bunch of other people, but I wanted to give, to give Mark a chance to say something before he had to leave. Um, and I guess I want to make sure I don't miss some people I see in the audience who I wasn't sure were going to be here, so I want to recognize them first. And that's our state senator, soon to be running for Congress, representing us, Jamie Raskin. And the latest in a line of great representatives on the county council from District 5, Tom Hucker. Are there other people here who are in kind of that category who I'm trying to see? Okay. Now, um, I want to introduce people who have served on the city council. Okay, I was looking to see. Um, and, I'll, and I'll do that in the order, I think, the chronological order in which they served. Uh, Lynn Bradley. <laughs> Lynn. <laughs> Reno Aldrighetti. <laughs> Former Mayor Steve Del Judas. Sharon Levy. Paul DeStacio. Former Mayor Ed Sharp. Jim Douglas. Hank Prensky. Former Mayor Kathy Porter. Carol Stewart. And current council member Terry Siemens. Roland Dawes. Former delegate, former gubernatorial candidate, and former council member, Heather Mazier. <laughs> Marie Rizzo. <laughs> Colleen Clay. <laughs> Donna Victoria. Current council member Seth Grimes. He was here. Uh, current council member Jarrett Smith. And current council member Kate Stewart. Did I miss anybody? Okay. So what I'd like to do is invite those folks who have served on the council to come up and reflect, as Mark did, on uh, their time on the council, what it might have meant to them, 
uh, I'd, I'd welcome them coming up. Uh, Sharon, you can't get out that quick. <laughs> Come on up, Sharon. Oh, yeah, yeah. So uh, I'd invite people to come up here, and I'd, and I'd, again, kind of start back at the beginning. There might be some ability to have some people who served with each other, but that may be the case, may not. Uh, you can say whatever you want. I've got questions that I can ask that might uh, elicit some uh, reflection or some comments. Lynn Bradley, Reno Aldrighetti, uh, Steve Del Judas, Paul DeStacio. Even though I'm not running for anything, there's a crowd and a microphone, so, yeah. you know, once in a while, And Sharon did decide to come up. Yay. And before you all start, I just want to ask a question or two that I think might elicit some changing answers over the course of the evening. First, how many hours per week do you think, on average, you spent on the job of being on the city council or being mayor? So, so when uh, when Sam Abbott became uh, became mayor, we opened up the microphone, and uh, we started with citizens' comments that weren't capped. So some nights we would get to the uh, the business of the council, maybe ten, Lynn, eleven, uh, and then uh, we would be so wound up at one or two in the morning that we would go over to the Tasty Diner or, or to or the uh, quarry house. Pancake's House or the Quarry House. <laughs> and, uh, and so it, it almost cost a lot of us our jobs, uh, but it, uh, uh, it was it's quite an experience. It, it was a really uh, amazing time in Tacoma Park. And, and did you spend a lot of time other than on Monday nights? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You want to? Go ahead. Yeah. I'm behind you so, so there were there were lots of committees. I mean, the whole the whole theory of what we were trying to do was to open up government to uh, to people and to create opportunities for people to uh, to participate. Um, uh, what uh, what Mark was talking about with neighborhoods uh, neighborhoods together. I came to Tacoma Park in in 1976 as a homeowner. But uh, I came in 1973 as an organizer um, through uh, a network that uh, Jerry Ernst, who's a Tacoma Park uh, resident, um, uh, was uh, uh, insisted on investing a total of $8,000, my salary, uh, to come in and begin a community organization with my office being, um, being uh, my AMC Gremlin car and stealing Xerox uh, time from... Uh, the National Center for Urban Ethnic Affairs, where he was the number two. And uh, Jerry had been funding community organizations throughout the U.S., working for Monsignor Gino Baroni, uh, who had developed community networks. And so the, the whole theory of, of, uh, uh, of community engagement and um, driving decisions back to people uh, uh, was, was something that I think that, that all of us really, really believed in. Uh, Sam, uh, when he became mayor, I, I have a hard time sorting between time on council and time before and after because there were just always committees and always uh, activities that we were engaged in and, and uh, with people moving forward on those, whether it be the crisis committee uh, fighting to uh, save Tacoma Elementary uh, or, uh, or the historic, uh, historic uh, district issues. Uh, that people were involved in, or so many others. Thoughts from other people? Well, when you speak about the number of hours, that's basically why I only was on for one term. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs> because it was, uh, we all had to represent our, the council in different committees. And at the time, I was also working at Tacoma Park Elementary School, and I couldn't receive phone calls. It was before emails and any kind of electronic <laughs> communication. So um, I would say, and then also we would get a packet of information. I don't know, probably now everything's through 
computer-based information. I, I, I remember the first time the police officer drove up to yeah. my house right <laughs> after I'd been elected, and this, this cop car comes up, and he comes up my steps, and all the neighbors are hanging out like, all right, he's going out and handcuffing. Yeah, with a, <laughs> a bundle this big. <laughs> I, I was going to have to say that I was going to answer the question about how many hours, but I, I know that my spouse was prob my probably was going <laughs> to contradict me there about and double it. So it, it was, it was as, as Sharon pointed out, it was uh, a labor of love. We did it because uh, that was what we wanted to do, uh, because what we believed in doing, and it, it had a cost, uh, although I certainly appreciate the fact that much of that cost was borne by my spouse. And I appreciate that. Steve? Uh, when, I, uh, when I was mayor, I was also on the clinical faculty at George Washington University, uh, the law school. Uh, what was good about that is I could, except when the judge wanted me in the courtroom, uh, set my own schedule somewhat. And I, uh, I, I know I spent at least eight hours working here uh, each week uh, as mayor at a minimum, taking time out of work to work here. And then, of course, in addition to that, there were the night meetings, not just uh, here with the council, uh, but in the community. There were uh, always meetings to go to. Um, but the one thing that it didn't prevent me from doing, and it's probably some of the richest parts of my memories of being here in Tacoma Park, was working with the youth. Um, my, my children were active in some of the sports programs. I worked with the soccer program in particular. And that was a, that was a, a, a nice relief from all of the uh, stress uh, and other demands on our time. Um, and it was something that uh, I will always remember working with the youth of the city, particularly in the soccer program. Um, I served for, well, you might say two and a half or three terms because the first term we shortened um, our terms in order to move the election date from March to November. And there was quite a difference from when we were citizens coming and sitting in the back of the room and then in those years and even after we got off the council. And I think the dynamics that changed, some of it is just the nature of, you know, us boomers being more active in those, that period, uh, a reaction to having, and, and in part, one of the reasons I ran was because Reagan was president and what could we do to rail against that machine? Yeah. Um, and so the, the dynamics and the changes were quite something to see. So when I came to meetings, you would, someone would stand up and you felt like if you'd, you had to live here at least 20 years in order to stand up at a microphone because people would stand up and say, I'm Miss Sherry Smith, I live on Tulip, I've lived there for 38 years. And then the next person would stand up, some of you have been here, I see shaking heads, and someone else then would stand up and I'm Mary Jones, I've lived here for 38 years. Now one time I was sitting out there and I believe the first person stood up and she'd been there 38 years and the second person woman was 37 years and she was sitting behind me and uh, she said and that woman's been a bitch all of those 37 years <laughs> <laughs> and she was this very nice quiet wow. little old lady you know but it was like okay I guess and so there was and there was quite a different style obviously and you know, we can go in the history of Sam, and then I was there when Del Judas, when, when Steve was, was mayor, and, and the different styles and the different issues. There was a lot of hours spent uh, on meetings and so forth, but, and I don't know if there's the same level of involvement. Um, in recent years, I've been working, and, you know, that took a lot of hours. I, I don't sense the same degree of participation, but perhaps I'm ignorant or not seeing it. And you've I think that- You've just become old and cranky because you've been here 38 years. I <laughs> am old and cranky, and it's true. And, it's true. And it's true. And it's true, it's true. And it's like, oh my God, we gotta do this again, you know? 
Um, and so there's a, I, I have a kind of ambivalence because I like hearing about the history and talking about things. There are other like old um, wounds, if you will, and battles like, why are we still talking about this? And do we have, you know, I, I will not use the roundup. Is Seth here? I won't use the roundup example, but I, um, I think that, was it, is Jim, are you still here? Jim Douglas, didn't you and Francis Phipps and I get accused by somebody that we'd been lobbied by the Agricultural Manufacturers Association because we questioned the roundup ban? I guess he's not gonna, he's gonna pretend he doesn't know me. And, <laughs> Um, and I'll tell one story and then I'll be quiet. Um, a few years after I was on the council, I was flying back from the West Coast with my sons. And I was seated across the aisle from them, but I was clearly, you know, a soccer mom. And I was sewing or doing something and my sons were over there and I was seated next to a man. Some of you have heard this story and I apologize for repeating it. Anyways, it turned out he was flying back to the D.C. area. He was a manpower specialist, and it was manpower, uh, for the Air Force, working for the RAND. He was retired from Air Force, working for the RAND Corporation. And he asked me where I was from, and I said, from Tacoma Park. And he said, oh, Tacoma Park, I do not understand why the town fathers could possibly think they know anything about nuclear armament and could ban nuclear weapons. I mean, it's just a town, for heaven's sakes, and they don't know anything about this. <laughs> And I said, well, part of this was the, the dynamic of making a statement that, you know, the biggest potholes are made by atom bombs. And so, and, and, and which was not my line. That's Sam made that one up. And then he said, well, I still don't understand how the town fathers, <coughs> emphasis fathers, and uh, I had some other line like, well, you know, we've, here we are in the D.C. area. We can't be evacuated, yada, yada. And he repeated the town fathers until finally I said, well, I was a town mother <laughs> on that council. He stopped talking to me the rest of the trip. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments before I dismiss you all and get some more people up here? Two, Love it. Just, just two, two things. One thing that struck me about the city newsletter is at that time is what a tool it, it was. I, just as one example, I remember a uh, citizen association decided they wanted to take advantage of uh, Arbor Day, uh, the Arbor Day uh, Foundation's uh, tree sale program. And they uh, put, uh, uh, they asked whether they could get space in the city newsletter. And, and uh, the association, to its surprise, got a full page that showed the pictures, sold thousands of trees. And so on. It was very interesting. There wasn't a tree staff person who, you know, who kind of manages managed tree relationships and so on and so forth. It was a community that saw a value, and a government that responded to that value by uh, by involving uh, the citizens and creating opportunities for involvement. And I think that was a uh, uh, that was an important value. I also just want to say that that. Uh, Many of us worked on the unification uh, efforts, and uh, uh, that uh, uh, certainly those were that was uh, uh, an issue that was begun by by Sam. But but had uh, Ed Sharp and uh, Tom Gagliardo uh, not uh, not jumped in uh, and brought that back to life, uh, that would not have happened in the city. And we owe them both thanks. I just want to mention one thing too. <laughs> During my term, and I didn't want to give a negative <laughs> slant because I really loved being on the city council, and it was also the time when we initiated the employee union, and that was, you know, very important. And also, we are known actually around the world for our nuclear free zone. And um, that was also during my term, and I give some credit to my husband, Jay. And um, we ban use of all products that have any origin in companies that produce nu nuclear weapons. And we've been the prototype for other towns and cities around the country and around the world. So I'm very proud to be a part of this community and part of the global, local and global community. <laughs> Um, I, I do want to. I do want to 
reference also the effort for unification. Um, one of the first things I got involved in as a Prince George's County resident of the city was the uh, citizens effort to unify the city. Um, and there were a lot of people who played a lot of roles in making that happen. And uh, frankly, uh, I'm very proud of what we were able to accomplish. Um, while I had moved on to the Prince George's County Council, um, we shouldn't forget that the Prince George's County Council supported a resolution to allow for the referendum. That never would have happened uh, when we first started that effort. The delegation in Annapolis supported the referendum. That never would have happened when we first started that movement. And I think it has something to do with um, what, uh, what happened with the city. Um, when we adopted the Nuclear Free Zone Ordinance, um, there, were, there were folks who would mock us, but it was very real. And we fought some battles over it, but it was very real. And uh, as Mark noted, we've had rent stabilization in Tacoma Park, and still do. And I remember when I first went to the Prince George's County Council, the first thing that was asked of me was whether I was going to try to bring rent stabilization to Prince George's County. Uh, as Mark noted, it's almost an impossible mission to do it on the county level, um, despite efforts to try to do that. Um, but uh, I think we won some battles. Um, we won the battle to preserve the fire station and uh, the fire department. And I think that as we matured um, and we sh showed people that we were serious about the nuclear free zone ordinance and about rent stabilization and about other things, uh, the community gained a respect that could no longer be ignored. And the desire to have the community brought into one county and unify the community, um, I think was a, a very significant uh, step for the community. Um, I don't think we um, can speak too much about what it meant for this community to be unified um, into one county. I have to. And I think the emphasis on all the different things in the universe that have to align for something like unification, because I recall the night that Sam brought in some of the state delegates to bring up unification, and he had failed to tell, this was before I was on the council, he had failed to tell the other council members that he was bringing them in to discuss unification. And I like remember the look on the faces of those other council members, like he's doing what, you know? <laughs> and the, that the whole dynamic and, and the, the various stars that become aligned, different people coming in in leadership roles, different movements and soldiers, if you will, yep. manning or staffing the battle lines. It, it's very, there, it, there's a history here of of activism, and I, I don't know, is it the same now? Or was it just that we were ensconced and we saw it more or believed it more, or what's happening now? And, and I think yeah. the next group of people coming up could comment on that very well. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Maybe Ed Sharp, Jim Douglas, Hank Prinsky, Kathy Porter could come up. All right. Hey, Barb, before you leave, I want to recognize that former city manager Barb Matthews is here. All right. All right. And, and also our current city manager, Suzanne Ludlow. All She's right. still in the room. And while they're getting settled, uh, Former 
City Attorney slash Corporation Counsel Tom Gagliardo. Tom, are you still in the room? Yes. And our current City Attorney, Sue Silber. And Melinda Perlman. Is Linda still here? Yes. And Ken, and Ken Sigmund. So, observations you want to make? Talk well, a little about yeah. I just wanted to to reflect on what um, Steve was talking about I, um, about how, how long people have been around. I remember when the when we were elected in 1985. I was elected, in, and Paul was elected for the first time, and Steve, and I made them all understand that. Um, I was the only one old enough to run for president because of, uh, you, if you remember, Steve, uh, that was a comment in the campaign that Steve not only was young, but he looked really young. Um, but now I have, to, I have to think that probably all three of us are too old to run for president. I think, I think Steve Del Judas of the four um, living mayors is the youngest of us all. <laughs> I wanted to share a good unification story. Um, after I was elected to the council, we had an annual meeting with the county executive from uh, Prince George's County, with Paris Glendening. And I thought I had a great idea to really put the pressure on him, because he was the greatest stumbling block to prevent the loss of his piece of Prince George's County and the tax revenue and the population and the uh, loss of face, in fact, for having people decide they want to go to another county instead of his. And he would never allow a vote at the county council. He would never uh, permit us to get close to our, our objective. But I had a plan, and I interrupted a, his speaking at our council meeting at this little uh, update on county and city affairs. And I, I told Paris that I thought it would be very important for him to get behind the the push for Tacoma Park's unification and to stop being such a stumbling block uh, because there was an upcoming election and, you know, there was a lot of people in Prince George's County and Tacoma Park is, whose votes he needed. And he turned around to me and he said, well, Hank, I've never really worried about that because I've always got between 80 and 90 percent of the votes in Tacoma Park, so I don't think I'm going to change my position on this issue. And all my power and all the clout of all the good people at Tacoma Park didn't matter until Paris Glendening became the governor of the state of Maryland, and all of a sudden he changed his perspective, and now he had no perspective for one county versus another. He was the governor of the whole state, and he then uh, stopped objecting to our, our goal of unification, which allowed the county council to get behind us and uh, our delegation in Annapolis. But... Uh, my power politics weren't worth shit with Paris. <laughs> let, me, let me just throw in another unification story. It's a, and I think Sam Abbott certainly deserves credit for starting the whole thing off, and we worked on it for 15 years before we finally got it. But I think that uh, Steve was maybe perhaps too modest when he talked about getting the county, the Prince George's County Council behind us. The reason we got the Prince George's County Council behind us was because of Steve. He, he was able to talk to them on it. Right, and yes, and it was it was Steve Del Judas on the Prince George's County Council that uh, that aligned those stars. And I also wanted to tell one other story, and it involves Ed. We used to we were the last couple years that we were trying to get unification. We went up to the to the state legislature and lobbied and lobbied and lobbied on the, you know, pr primarily the Prince George's delegation, who were not completely convinced, particularly with that strange, wacko mayor we had up there. And I remember talking to one of the older members of the Prince George's delegation, talking about why this was all important. He said, I'm not going to support you. You've got that wacko mayor. And I said, oh, let me introduce our mayor, Ed Sharp, <laughs> who was dressed about as he is now. And he looked at Ed, and Ed started talking to him. And so I think that it was a process. We had, we had the right people there at the right times when we needed them. And, I, and I'll just chime in for a second and say, from my perspective, when I came on the council in 93 and Ed was mayor, our first council meeting after we got sworn in, we adjourned and went to Rockville to testify at the, right. at the delegation hearing because we had the unification bill in. 
and it was like, oh, I'm in for a ride here. Yeah. And and Ed really pushed it and made made it happen at the end. Well, I want to echo a couple of points that Reno made, but I also want to start with the observation I have made in the past is that the best thing that happened to us with regard to unification was when Steve moved out of the city. <laughs> and, and that's a serious point, actually. You talk about stars aligning, because one of the claim, one of the statements that we were getting uh, the year before, at least I got the year before, was, oh, well, you can't unify. Uh, uh, some of the ca- uh, Prince George's County Council members said, oh, no, you can't do that because then Steve couldn't be on the county council anymore. Now, that's bogus because, you know, he could move out of the city if he wanted to at that point. Um, but that was going to be a reason that some people used. But then when he moved out of the city, that whole issue went away. And Hank is totally right. When Glenn Denning was no longer the Prince George County Executive, he was running for governor at that point. Hey, he, he backed off on that. That's right. A couple of people on the Prince George County Council were running for county executive. So those votes were in play in Tacoma Park. So there was just a whole bunch of things. And, and Peter Francho, I just want to do a shout-out to him, was in a very prominent position in, um, in uh, Annapolis at that point. And he was a guide. He, he was a guide to us in terms of the timing. And we've got, we've got the timing totally correct. And um, I don't know if, Kathy, if you were at a m- meeting when the, you know, the bills start, the, there's a, a flip-over point where it's, it, you, you go through the House first, and then it flips over to the Senate. Crossover. Crossover. And when we went to that meeting with um, Mike Miller's chief aide, um, we were sitting there with him, and he said, you've brought this to us at exactly the right time. And that was because... Peter Francho made sure that we brought it to them at exactly the right time. I do want to uh, to second what um, Reno said about Tom Gagliardo and include Kathy Porter in that, along with Bev Havada. The three of them were, were there the whole time. That was the – there were a lot of citizens who were involved. That was really important. But the three of them were, were in the trenches the whole way. And, you know, that was part of the whole reason that it was successful. But – don't want to monopolize too much, but the the <laughs> next thing that happened because of the unification vote was that more people wanted to be in Tacoma Park, if you remember, because it was going to move into Montgomery County, and that's when we got the annexation effort. So we thought we had done all this work for unification. It was all over. Oh, no, things were starting up again because of annexation, and so we had to learn that whole, whole deal about how do you annex property um, from outside the uh, city, inside to inside the city, and we had to run a whole effort on that. And that was a whole, you know, that was a whole other education. We became unified in 1997 and uh, just realized the strange coincidence that I went into real estate in 1998. So. <laughs> Obviously a connection. <laughs> and, and, I didn't even know I was that smart. <laughs> and, and, and once we dealt with annexation in addition to unification, then we had to deal with how to tax the people who had come in through annexation for part year and paid their taxes to Prince George's already. Not, not one of our success stories, no. I'm afraid. <laughs> Let's get beyond unification. Did anything else happen? So, so I guess three things occur to me. Um, one is we've talked a lot about and sort of the, the, um, the DNA, the history of the city is, is uh, the efforts to stop the freeways and so on, and that certainly made a huge difference. But the other thing that made a huge difference, basically contemporaneous with that in terms of the look and feel of the city is all the work of the folks, who, none of whom are really here tonight, I think, that started what is now Historic Tacoma, um, probably coming out of an original um, historic preservation or historic society. But the effort of Historic Tacoma to recognize the housing stock that we have and the Victorian suburb, some suburb aspects of it, and not just have a city here that could be any kind of city, but a city that, in fact, um, restored that Victorian suburb look and feel. And, and I think, you know, the, the reason that, that we are um, have what we have today goes back to that group of people from the late 70s. So that's number one. Number two, oh, Ed and I, Steve, others that came on the council in the late 80s, one of the – it's sort of the unsexy part of governing, but the whole change of the um, city charter from – 
um, what was basically a mayor and council form of government to a, to a council and city manager form of government. Part of that was redistricting so that the mayor had a vote, but part of it was, was finally mer migrating the authority to run the city over to, the, to a city manager and getting out of what you heard from the prior panel of council members going and sitting on committees that were running units of government and so on. So I think that's, you know, that's a legacy of that period of 25 years ago or so is to, is to take the city government into um, sort of the modern age of, of council manager city. And then the third thing I'll say is I spent a lot of time, I was in, I'm probably the only person from Ward 2 that's actually the old Ward 2, which was then in the old town part of Tacoma a Park before we did the redistricting. So I represented what's now that old town area. Spent a huge amount of time working with the business owners and business associations on trying to deal with, with um, planning in the old town area, Tacoma Junction area. And it really has taken you know, 25 years before we are now seeing finally a real blossoming. And there were lots of fits and starts, lots of different efforts, but we are now really seeing for the, what we envisioned yeah. 25 years ago is really what would take place um, in Old Town, um, in the junction, and now hopefully spreading over to the, our, our neighbors on the D.C. side as well. And it, uh, a lot of people spent a lot of time on design, on recruiting businesses, and it just took that long for for the economy to move up the tracks to Tacoma Park to actually um, give us what we needed. So those are three other things other than has been mentioned so far this evening. And, and another thing that I think was important at that time and continues to be important, it was mentioned by the earlier group, is rent stabilization. Right. I think we started rent stabilization in 1980, and um, both Mark Elrich and Ed Sharp had a lot to do with that. And it has really in a very significant way guided the way this community has developed. The fact that we continue to have a diverse community in spite of the fact that um, single-family homeowner ownership homes have continued to go up in price, the fact that we continue to have a diverse community is because we continue to have rents that are um, low enough for a diverse group of people b by income, by race, by ethnicity to live in Tacoma Park. If that were not true, we would probably look like Bethesda. We wouldn't have places where people with <laughs> other than middle class or upper middle class incomes could live. And so I think rent stabilization ought to be given some credit for the enormous role it has played um, in Tacoma Park in shaping the diverse community that we are. And I also want to say that one of the things that I remember that I am most proud of the council that I sat on that we did um, just, what, eight years ago was redo the rent stabilization ordinance with help of an expert in rent stabilization that we imported um, from California to get the law in, a, in a, a situation to redo it and to make it so that it was up to date and could last for another, hopefully, several decades. So I really, we, we need to think about things like that when we think about what this community is today. I just wanted to do, sorry, I just want to do, go back to unification for a second and do it. Uh, one more shout out to uh, Suzanne Ludlow, um, who was responsible, right, I'm remembering this correctly, you were responsible for all of the work that was necessary after unification occurred. There was all the bureaucratic stuff of getting the deeds uh, issues addressed and um, various uh, administrative things that had to happen. Um, when people's uh, counties changed from Prince George's to Montgomery, that was um, that was a big headache. I I I trust that you now see now that you're the city manager that you understand that a lot of the work that you did then is the reason that you were selected now because you have all of that knowledge uh, that nobody anybody anywhere else in the country could possibly have, and so you're the perfect choice it seems to me um, for the job. Um, we haven't talked about non-U.S. citizen voting, which is that. something that occurred uh, when I was after you, right? After the 1990 census. Right. right. And uh, Jamie's not here anymore, but Jamie Raskin was involved in, the, in the, that effort as well. And that was, that, was, um, uh, that was an interesting exercise to go through uh, to figure out the kind of the intellectual justification for why something's so crazy actually makes sense, and it does make sense to me. Um, 
and then to deal with people, and I recall this happening, who didn't live in the city, who just wanted to come down and take up time <laughs> at city council meetings telling us why we were wrong. And, and, and it was <laughs> a result right. of that that I actually developed a philosophy about who should be able to speak at Tacoma Park <laughs> citizen meetings. And, and so if you don't live in, the way I looked at it, if you didn't live in the city, I was interested in hearing from you if you had facts or information to present about a subject. But I really didn't care what you thought about it. <laughs> you know? And you were just wasting my time if you were saying you were against or for it. The only, the only people I was interested in in those cases were people who lived in the city where they were against or for it. But anyway, I was able to develop a, a philosophy for letting people speak at council meetings. The, the share of the vote campaign, as we called it in 1991, I believe, um, is also one of the, the, the shining glories of, of the activist part of Tacoma Park. Um, one of the things I've told people, and I've, I've traveled a lot, um, and in, in a way represent the city of Tacoma Park, I traveled to our sister city in El Salvador in the middle of a war zone in 1990, representing the good wishes and the goodwill of the people at Tacoma Park. I traveled to an international nuclear free zone convention uh, representing the city. And in all these situations, people like uh, Lynn Bradley's uh, seatmate on the uh, airplane, people make jokes and people understand the, the funny parts that sound wrong. But I always told people that uh, one of the things that makes Tacoma Park so great is that we eat our vegetables first before we get to dessert, that we run a well-managed, well-organized, successful city, and we take stands on issues of national and international importance, that we do our homework before we go out to play, that we have uh, the highest level of services delivered in all of Montgomery County and all of Prince George's County, um, and our tax dollars are well spent by an active and, and well-trained and well-responsible city government. Um, the Share the Vote campaign was, was an astounding accomplishment while Ronald Reagan and, and uh, people were lambasting immigrants to this country um, for being freeloaders, and we welcomed people who had the interest and the desire to become members of their community. They cared about when the garbage got picked up. They cared about the schools. They cared about uh, the streets and sidewalks. And why, in, in fact, would we not want those people to participate in the affairs of the community? Um, the other activist things, in 1990, we, we passed the, the strongest anti-smoking law in the, hist in the eastern half of the United States. Yeah, um, yes, you, you were featured, as I recall, <laughs> in a picture. In on, the the front, on the front page of the USA Today, 1.2 million copies of that picture were produced <laughs> one day only. And that was the last time that, that Mark talked about um, not, not letting the, the reporters bait him. Um, I learned a valuable lesson uh, of not taking suggestions from reporters who thought it would be a really cute picture if they took my picture sitting on top of the cigarette vending machine that was outside the police department. Uh, and that was a humiliating experience <laughs> to see 1.2 million copies of that photograph. But the city's activist stands for a nuclear free zone, and uh, I would echo what Sharon said, uh, that we are known and, and respected around the world. And the, the simplest statement I've ever been able to come up with to explain the nature of our nuclear free zone is that we in Tacoma Park choose to deny the profitability of the nuclear weapons industry, uh, that we won't spend any taxpayer dollars to support corporations that are involved in the production of nuclear weapons. And these things sound frivolous and they sound foolish when the Washington Post writes about them every August because they don't have anything else to write about. Um, but these are what define the character and the nature of not only our lives here, but our children and our grandchildren's lives here. And, you know, my, my son is about to be 25. He came to his first city council meeting when he was three days old. Um, he knows about the history of a place like this throughout his life, and, and I'm sure that half of the people in this audience have children and, and grandchildren who've grown up knowing that this is a community that values its citizens, values its politics, and values the fact that we have something to say about how we live. 
And that's why I sell Tacoma Park as the greatest place to live anywhere in the Washington metropolitan area. And, and I'm not and, and I'm not running for anything. No. And and Jim gets the really? final Jim gets the final <laughs> no, so I, I was just <laughs> I could have fooled me. <laughs> no, I was just gonna there was one other thing and Bruce reminded me of this actually when was the when was the campaign on the same sex marriage act two years ago? Three years ago? Uh, Whenever yeah. it was, but anyway, at, at an event, and I had forgotten this, but but I wanted to mention it bec because when I think it was our council <laughs> did a resolution um, acknowledging partnerships domestic in this partners. city, yeah. domestic right. partnerships as one of the very early to steps of a city right. government right. to to you know take that long journey, which is we, we is not yet complete. We established a domestic partnership registry in the city. Right, of exactly. Park. So that was which, one of the very early steps uh, which, also, which I ended think. up leading to the local government insurance trust offering uh, insurance for domestic partners in order to keep us in the pool and offering it to everybody else right, in the state. Right. So, you know, there are little right. things that a, a one government can do that have a ripple and, effect. And I, I, I also hope that I'm not incorrect about this, but our mayor, Bruce Williams, was the first openly gay elected official in the entire metropolitan Washington area. Yep. All right. All right. Thank you all. We'll get the next group up here. Uh, Carol Stewart, Terry Siemens, right. Roland Dawes, Heather Mazier, Marie Rizzo. <laughs> if they're still in the room. Yeah, I think. Marie just walked out. <laughs> Maybe she'll come back in like Sharon did. I'm only 86. <laughs> Oldest man in the pool pub. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to all of you up here. Um, some served together, some didn't. Uh, it's a we've we've moved moved on a little bit to more of the later, I guess later '90s, early 2000s. Um, I'll start with a question I did with the with the first group. How much time did you put in on the average week as a council member? Well, I can tell you when I started on the city council, um, it became almost a full-time job for me uh, for a couple reasons. One, there were a lot of issues that I thought needed to be dealt with in the city government. And uh, for another thing is I was a rookie and I didn't know what I was doing, so it took me a lot of time to, to figure <laughs> things out. Uh, and uh, I see that... Uh, that time commitment has has changed off and on through my uh, time here at the at the council. I think the big difference is that uh, in the current years, it's uh, spending more time with uh, some of the legislators outside of Tacoma Park and trying to bring resources and and um, and needs uh, to Tacoma Park. Being in the city council is the hardest job I ever had <laughs> because it's the issues that people care most about and are most engaged with and are constantly in touch with you about. Um, but that's what makes being on the city council and serving this community such a valuable experience because you're so connected to the community and its issues and its desires. And people think nothing of picking up the phone and calling you about their leaves needing to be picked up or someone who didn't uh, shovel their sidewalks or the trash didn't get picked up the way it needed to. They might not pick up the phone to call you about their similar interest in making sure all children have health insurance or other issues that you deal with at other levels of government. But Tacoma Park was, for me, always this place where we know how to put our values into action. We don't just 
care about those issues. Like Hank said, we we get that work done, and then we start doing add-on issues that show what we care about in really meaningful ways. I always love letting people know that I w started working in a city that has a tool lending library and a silo for corn for people who have alternative fuel heating systems in their homes or um, the stories about Roscoe, I mean, all the different things that, that make our community so unique. Um, as a uh, first-time candidate for city council, some of you have heard me tell this story, but it's the quintessential story in my mind about uh, why Tacoma Park has always been such a utopia to me and my wife Deborah, and why we have loved living here so much. I was knocking on doors, making my case very vigorously on why I could carry the mantle of Carol Stewart's amazing leadership after she was done serving Ward 2. And I met a woman on the doorstep who quizzed me on all these issues, and I, we were right in lockstep on everything. And she said, you know, I do think you're the most qualified candidate in this race, but I'm not going to vote for you. I'm supporting uh, the other candidate because he's Latino and I want to see more diversity on the council. And I said, that is a really great thing to support. I agree we should be fostering as much diversity in the community as possible, and I'd love to see more uh, people of color serving on the council. And just in terms of diversity, I just want to make sure that you know I'm an openly gay candidate for council as well. And she said, oh, honey, this is Tacoma Park. That doesn't count as diversity anymore. <laughs> My turn. When I was first asked to run for city council, I didn't want to. I was afraid. <laughs> but um, when I finally did and I became a member of the city council, I spent so much time studying and trying to figure out how we did everything and why we did it that way. So much time that my husband was bringing my lunch to me at my desk instead of me taking his lunch to him. But we, I studied and I learned so much and I was able to participate in so many of the things that the city was doing and it really does broaden your ideas and your scope of government and how people feel about it. I was very active. <clears throat> I was on the board of the fire department as a city council member. And I learned a lot there. And it, it was one of my more favorite parts of, of the job was being on the, council, being on the uh, board of the fire department and at first, they, they weren't too pleased with me, but I stuck it out, and now I'm an honorary member. <laughs> but but being, being on the city council is a, a job that is work, but it's good work. Mm -hmm. And it's work that broadens you and helps the, and helps the city if you stick to it and do a, a decent job. And I really, really enjoyed it. Yeah, you do. Oh, yeah, I love it. Uh, my name's Roland Dawes. I was on Ward 4 uh, for one term. And I enjoyed it. Uh, working with the people in the Cornwall Park. And as long as I've been in the Cornwall Park, I've been here since I was three years old. And very few people I knew, only the bigger people in the office I knew, all of them, because I worked all the time and I had a quite a few little jobs even before I was old enough to, to be, leave home even and go to school 
never missed a day out of school, Tacoma Elementary School. The one, when I said Tacoma Elementary School, we had two schools, one black and one white. And I went to the black school, and we had like 50 students in one class. And the school had two rooms, and when I was first started, they only had one room open. And I succeeded, and I learned, I came up to life, and I think everybody in the Coma Park know me now. And I went up to business, and I was a good business man. I worked hard, and I saved my money, and I bought a lot of properties. I bought, I have been into everything that's business-wise, and I've been successful at it. Everything I went into, and now at the prison, I have a barber shop, Roland's Barber Shop, 7214 Carroll Avenue, and I've been there since 1965. And now I have two son, I have three sons, and two of them are working for me in the shop. Matter of fact, they run the shop now. <laughs> But I go in and just have somewhere to go and enjoy my enjoyment with a friend. I have a Joyce Green and being around her and she likes to go and everything. And with her and with my six children I had, and my wife is deceased uh, in an automobile accident. Well, I've been a very successful fellow. I had my ups and downs with people, but I had to learn in life. You don't get nowhere, or you can't be nobody if you don't respect the other man. And I was brought up to say in my life to uh, when I talk to older people is if they're old lady, I said, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, and thank you, ma'am. And I, and I have really enjoyed life, as I say, and I've been very successful, and I'm 86 years old, and I'm just enjoying life as much as I ever enjoyed it. But not quite as like I did. <laughs> but I am still trying to do better and be better. Don't care what age I get to be. I'm going to be the Indian that never die. He's just going to fade away. <laughs> any, any other comments from yeah, the other? I I want to say something to the, to the citizens who are here and the ones who are watching and the ones who are here with us in spirit. Yeah. Part of the reason why we have always been able to get things done, not just at the municipal level, but to push a solid agenda through the county council in Annapolis with our delegations, um, at the highest levels of government, even taking some of our ideas in, into the Congress where, well, they don't get anything done there. But um, we have had an enormous amount of success standing up for what we believe in because of the citizen engagement in our advocacy. When I was in Annapolis, anytime I would advance something that we cared about in the city, it wasn't just me or Tom Hucker or Jamie Raskin or Sheila Hickson that was advocating it. Everyone knew it came with a legion of people in a moment's notice who were ready to put boots on the ground, knock on doors, make phone calls, turn out and vote, that this is an engaged citizenry that has to be respected and listened to. And that's what has always created our community transformation here. And it comes from standing on the shoulders of giants. I never had the honor to meet Sam Abbott, but his reputation precedes him, of course. Oh, yeah. And I know that the whole time I was working on the fracking issue, for example, when we were in our toughest moments, when it felt like we'd never get moratoriums in place or prevent the oil rigs from coming in, I'd always just tell people, I'm from Tacoma Park. 
And if we have to, we'll stand in front of those damn rigs and make sure that they don't put a drill in the ground because we know how to fight for what we believe in where we're from. And it's that kind of spark in our hearts where we don't just advocate things at an intellectual level, though we're a city that prides itself on being fairly intellectual. (laughs) We fight with our hearts in this community. And we don't just fight for ourselves. We fight for each other. We fight for our neighbors. We fight for our neighborhood. And we fight for a larger vision on what we care about with these progressive values. And that is the resonance of this city. That is the vibration that pulls people into this community to move here, to raise their children here, to be advocates here, to make a future, and to be a part of this history that has been created for generations. And and Deborah and I just feel very, very honored to have had our opportunity to put our voice in the mix in a community that has always meant so much to us as well. Thank you. I was... And I uh, I think building... Building on what Heather just said, it's, it is the history, and look at how much history we're hearing about tonight, and uh, all of us have to uh, build on that history and continue to build on it, and so when we talk about the, the nuclear free zone, you know, we should recognize uh, Pat Loveless, our official peace delegate. Uh, Yay, Patty! Because those issues are still important to us. And when we talked about, uh, we heard about rent stabilization tonight, uh, we need to, to be active and think about uh, are we maintaining that, uh, that policy and, uh, and are we uh, continuing that uh, to meet the affordable housing needs uh, that are so critical uh, to the character of Tacoma Park. Uh, we have, uh, you know, many of the... Uh, Buildings, the apartment buildings that were under uh, rent stabilization, many of those have converted to condominiums, which puts them into market rate. Uh, many of them are being bought out by uh, housing nonprofit organizations that uh, are relieved from rent stabilization uh, to get the financing to do the uh, renovations that are needed in those buildings. But uh, you know, building on our history, we have to continue to think about how do we. Uh, still address the needs of the most uh, vulnerable people in our neighborhoods. Uh, the, uh, uh, the council worked uh, in what, 2000, or 1998, I guess it was, to save the library when the, when the county wanted to cut the funding to that. Uh, again, we, uh, we took action in 2009 to save the Piney Branch Pool, and now that's in jeopardy again. So there's, the work continues. We need to have uh, uh, continued activism in the community. We need the participation in the community. Uh, we have a legacy to live up to, and uh, behooves us all to, to do that. Thank you all. Thank you. And of course, Bruce, when, when we've been walking down memory lane, um, this council and some overlap with some people who were in the previous council, with Kathy, you, Mark, um, we worked, my packets for my term were always filled with the work necessary to oversee the reconstruction of this beautiful community center. Mm-hmm. And that is something that um, our community can be really proud of having accomplished as well. Definitely. Yes. Thank you. We have one final group. Uh, if I can invite up Colleen Clay, right. Donna Victoria, Jarrett Smith, and Kate Stewart. All right. Did I miss anybody? And then uh, we can go out and have some cake, and uh, we'll finish up. And I want to make. Sh- and of those coming up, I want to make sure that. Uh, Somebody talks about tax duplication. I was going to mention it. <laughs> Since that's a long time. Issue. Any comments? Uh, well, let's see. I served on that committee for tax duplication. That's a, that's a long-standing, uh, tough issue, tax duplication. Um, 
And I guess in some ways it has surprised me that it's a nut that we haven't been able to crack, but I think it's one of those uh, lessons in politics about um, trying to figure out what the, what the right combination is. Uh, people were working on it before I got onto the uh, tax duplication committee, and people be uh, continue to work on it. It's been it's been a long haul, you know, just ten years that I've been um, watching it take place, and we have uh, people who have moved on to the tax duplication issue, um, you know, and it's a lesson about how you build uh, how you build the political will to make uh, to make a change. Um, when our current county executive was uh, running for office, I supported the other guy, um, uh, Steve Silverman. And one of the reasons why I supported him uh, is because he was far more uh, supportive in a more meaningful way about resolving the tax duplication issue with Tacoma Park. And so... You know, from a political standpoint, I felt like we um, we had a fair amount of momentum, and um, I don't think that we're going to see a solution to tax duplication until we have a new county executive. Um, and that's one of those things where when you go to the polls, you make a vote, and you have to check off the variety of things that are important to you, and tax duplication didn't make it to the top of the uh, primary issue on which people um, voted, including in this community. Well, one thing that surprises me is, um, you know, there's all this advocacy in our community, and uh, tax duplication does not rise to even a peep. And you would expect that more residents would send me emails, um, uh, call me, or stop me in the street to talk about tax duplication. I just don't hear it. I have heard more regarding safe grow <laughs> than whether or not we're gonna get our money back from Montgomery County. And I, that's one issue I just don't understand. I don't understand why residents are not outraged. I mean, the county is taking our money. It's not their money, it's our money. And residents should be sending emails to county council members, should be calling county me council members. And one county council member was upset with me because I was telling so many residents to call him. But residents need to continue to do it because it's not going to change until they decide it's going to change. And we need to put pressure on them to make the change. Can, can I just say, you need to come to Ward 2, because I have to tell you that every other letter, every other phone call, every other person who stopped me in the street on the way home from work as I was headed to my house would say to me, hey, I have this problem, and it might be I have a problem with leaves or with trash or I, I don't like this sidewalk issue. And then it would always end with, and I pay double the taxes to live in this city, and so therefore you should really do something about it. So it's an interesting ward difference because at least 50 percent, <laughs> at least. So as the um, newest member of the city council, and it's only been a year now, um, thank you. Um, I just have to say tonight is an incredibly humbling experience, and it is amazing, and I count myself incredibly lucky to be counted among all the amazing people who have come before and I just want to reiterate what has been said up here tonight about um, the residents of this community and how they're the ones who push us, keep us honest, and keep us moving and doing things. And I know it was raised, somebody asked earlier on one of the earlier panels what, what's been done lately. Um, is a lot. <laughs> um, and it's really because of the residents. Um, we... Um, the purchase of uh, the property at McLaughlin um, School this year, that came from residents. Um, believe me, it was, uh, it came up, it was a resident who identified this for us. Um, it was residents who very quickly over the holidays got together, uh, found out information. It was our amazing staff who put together the information for us so that the council along with residents could move forward and purchase this property. Um, it's, you know, residents who are moving forward and working with the city 
on a youth collaborative to make for sure that the young people, all the young people in our communities, have access and opportunities available to them. And that's something that is very exciting that we're working on um, and with residents in the community. Um, and i just like to say thank you to everyone, and it's been a wonderful evening. Diane, thank you for that slideshow. It was terrific. Thank you so much. You want to wrap up by 9.30? Cake. Yes. <laughs> okay. I, I actually have something else I, I, have something else I want Go to ahead. say, though. Um, uh, I want to say that being a council member is um, is a gift, and it is a gift that the citizens give to the person who serves on the council. Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed my time as a council member. I served for six years, um, and I one of the things I learned was to be a really good decision maker. Um, and I, when I go to job interviews, people say, oh, well, you know, what did you learn on the city council? And the, the first year, I learned that the city council is all about how well the city picks up your leaves. <laughs> and, um, and my partner can attest to that because um, people would come to the house and talk to me and if I wasn't home to her about how their leaves didn't get picked up and when were their leaves going to get picked up. So that was sort of my first lesson of the council. Um, but I talk about how you learn to be a really good decision maker. And, and um, I spend about 20 hours a week on the council. And the time that I used to spend on the council, I now spend about 15 hours teaching kids to sail. I teach uh, social justice Sunday school. And I work on the folk festival. So I do all those three things in the time that I used to do the city council. And, um, uh, but, but being a really good decision maker is one of the things you learn. And it's about being at local politics. Uh, when we teach sailing, if you want someone to learn to sail really well, you don't put them in a 40-foot yacht. You put them in a 15-foot dinghy because the, the feedback is immediately. If you make a mistake in the small boat, you go in the water. Um, and, and you learn not to, to do that. And, um, and working in the city council is, is kind of like that. And the other thing that I want to say is that, um, so I had only lived here for a couple of years when I came to the, uh, the city council position. And before my partner and I moved from the San Francisco Bay Area here to Tacoma Park, uh, I told my, my father we were moving to the East Coast, and he had a s small East Coast bias. Um, and he's like, you don't want to go to the East Coast. And he says, for one thing, you don't want to leave San Francisco. Like, you finally found this place where your family is welcome, and you have, you know, you have kids. And he was really, and my father and I didn't get along when I was a teenager, and that would just be a polite way to say that. So he was expressing this very deep concern for me that I was going to leave this uh, bastion of happiness that I had found in San Francisco where everyone is accepting. I'm like, you know, it's okay, Dad. Like, I can't go anywhere, but I can go other places, and I can go to Tacoma Park. And so um, then I got elected to the council, and, um, and that kind of surprised him. And so um, when the time for the 4th of July parade came around, my father was... Uh, visiting with us, and I did not really want to ride in the car. I wanted to be able to, you know, get out and communicate with people. So my family and I, we got on our bicycles, and I put my parents in my car, which made the lady who runs the parade kind of unhappy, but, but you know, she got over it. Um, and so my dad and my mom rode in the car, and everyone was like, Colleen, hi! look at there's Colleen's parents and and we got to the end of the parade route and my dad was like those those people they like you <laughs> they're like yeah they voted me into office he's like but no like they genuinely <laughs> like you and they accept you and it's all okay I'm like yeah dad it's all okay Tacoma Park is a place that accepts everybody you can come here and be happy and be comfortable um, the next year he called me. He's like, are we coming for the 4th of July? <laughs> I said, yeah, absolutely. So he came for the 4th of July, and, and Karen made uh, T-shirts for everybody. And so my dad had a red shirt that on the back of it had Colleen's dad, and my mom's shirt said Colleen's mom, and my shirt said Colleen. And uh, Karen's shirt said Colleen's everything, and the kids had ones that said Colleen's kid. It was kind of cute. And my father, he just sucked that up, and he really loved it. Um, and, um, and that experience in some ways helped um, changed my relationship with him. And he died in 2009, but, um, um, but that was another gift that Tacoma Park gave to me. And it's because it's a place that is so accepting of 
everybody that people can can find their place. And I, I thank you all for that. It it was very meaningful to me. And I just want to say in concluding that I've enjoyed my 22 years of working with everybody in Tacoma Park, all the residents, all of the people that I've served with on the city council, the great staff that we have here, just so many of you in making this, helping to make this such a wonderful place to live. And I thank you all for being here tonight. I hope this was just the first opportunity that my colleagues and I who have served on the council have to talk about what's important in Tacoma Park and talk about it with the people who have helped make it what it is and that we can have continuing conversations like that going into the future. And I hope that we can also have a, the opportunity as a, as a community to remember and hold dear those people and those ideas who have made us what we are. We now have a newly established commemoration commission that's going to be uh, taking, yes, we have a, one of the members here. <laughs> and it's, it's to make sure that we give opportunities for people to recognize the good work that so many people have done to keep track of that and not lose track of what's happened in the past. Tom Gagliardo reminded me of something tonight that we need to fix, which was when we uh, put new chairs in the auditorium, when we remodeled it. There had been right up here, I think this first one in the first row here, uh, the, the Brent Dillingham chair, and that name disappeared from the back of the chair when the new chairs came in. We need to remember and recognize that. We don't want to lose our history. And so this was an evening to make sure that we all don't lose our history and that we understand why we are here and what we mean and why it's so special. So thank you all for coming. Uh, outside there's cake. There's also a box with 150th anniversary pins. If you want to make a small donation, take a pin. That would be wonderful. We have a, more than enough pins, and uh, they'll continue to be around and available for people. And thank you all. And I want to thank Diana Cohn, Meryl Leffler, City Clerk Jesse Carpenter, Executive Assistant Peggy Washington for helping to put this together. Let them eat cake. <laughs>